Meng Haorang Song Returning to Deer Gate at Night A temple bell sounds as dusk approaches. Fisher folk clamour as they jostle for the ferry. Others walk the sand path to the river village. I too ride the boat as far as Deer Gate. At Deer Gate, moonlight cuts through mist around the trees, and suddenly I've reached the place of Hermit Pan. The cliff side door, the path through pines now desolate. Few traces of the hermit who once passed back and forth. So we're back with a poem by Meng Haorang, a writer that we encountered in the first sections of the book. Let's make a very brief reminder of who he was. Meng Haorang lived in mostly the first half of the 8th century. He is therefore a high tang poet. He was from the central area of China, the region of Hubei and the, the town of Xiangjiang. He was quite unsuccessful in the civil service examinations, so for most of his life, after a few wanderings, uh, he adopted the persona of the retired scholar of the hermit, and uh, he went back to his hometown to live, and uh, he spent most of his time in the place that appears in this poem, Deer Gate Mountain, that was uh, Lumen Shan. There he had a hermitage, and there he spent a lot of his time. Now, if you remember, we said that Meng Haorang was, uh, he was an unrecognized poet for, for most of his lifetime uh, as a figure, but he is a very valued poet today. And uh, his forte, his specialty is, along with Wang Wei, nature poetry, natural scenery poetry, landscape poetry. And this is an example of that type of poetry that he makes. Yeah? In the tradition, some of the more characteristic features of Meng Haorang are generally mentioned as being his interest in the human aspect of the natural landscape, whereas one way is more abstract. Meng Haorang usually shows people and the, in the marks of human presence in the natural landscape. And uh, he's, he generally uses a style that is quite simple, lucid and uh, refreshing. Also in the poetic language, in the original Chinese it seems, it's quite plain, spontaneous. Uh, well, so this might feel a bit bland sometimes, but he still managed yes, to you know, represent a profound and vast imaginary world, as he does in this poem. Uh, Tao Qian, a poet we've also we've already mentioned uh, from the period of disunion, is a big influence in the landscape poetry of the type that Meng Haoran does. But um, Tao Qian is a bit more philosophical, and Meng Haoran is more down to earth, more colloquial. Okay, so let's go. Uh, with this poem then. Uh, we're going to analyze it as usual, couplet by couplet, although there are two stanzas in this poem that are clearly um, separated by the topic they talk about. So they, they could be the two parts of the poem. So let's start. A temple bell sounds as dusk approaches. Fisher folk clamor as they jostle for the ferry. It's the end of the day, it's evening, yeah, dusk is approaching, people are returning to their homes. A temple bell sounds, remember, in, in China, in ancient China, just as in, in pre-modern Europe, uh, the bells of religious institutions were, along with the natural well, cycles of sunlight and darkness, the only measures of time. There were no clocks, there were no uh, in public buildings or, or anywhere. In, in the imperial palace, they had some clock-like uh, te technological devices or clepsidras and things like that. But in a rural place, or, or relatively rural, the bells of the Buddhist temples tolling indicate the end of the day. They are the sound of the end of the day. So the bell sounds and people go home and uh, the, the common people depicted here are fishermen. So this is probably a, a, a region or an area uh, around uh, where Meng Haoran is living that has a big fisherman population. Uh, some of them are jostling and pushing to get the ferry. They want to cross to the other side of the river. Uh, others probably live their, their villages on this side of the river, so they go walking. And this is what the next couplet tells us. <clears throat> 
Others walk the sand path to the river village. I too ride the boat as far as the gate. So everybody is going home. Some fishermen are taking the boats to cross the river. Others are walking through the beach and back to their huts. Menhauran joins the ones that are crossing the river. Yeah, he is going by boat to Deer Gate. So pretty straightforward, pretty, pretty simple, this first stanza. You know, it has no cryptic or hermetic images or references. It just seems to be a, a rather populist depiction of what is happening at sunset in a relatively rural context. I would mention that, in, that, that there does seem to be an, an implication in the second couplet. There does seem to be a, a foregrounding of uh, the difference between the people and the hermit. So others walk the sand path. I, I too, because others are also in the boat, but I ride the boat. So even if it's at a subliminal level, the poet is already pointing out the difference between the mass of the people and he himself, who is following a different way. In fact, as we will see in the next stanza, the poem seems to be progressing from a beginning where the poet is still in the world and surrounded by people to a, a, a more inner, inner and inner and recessive and intimate space for the poetic persona, which ends up in a lonely place, alone in the hermitage and completely cut off from all the world and time and space. Okay, so first stanza, we've just said it. It's a uh, nightfall. People are going home. The poet is also going home. So we get a jump to the next uh, pair of couplets in the next stanza. Some the traveling time goes by. At dear gate, moonlight cuts through mist around the trees. And suddenly I've reached the place of Hermit Pang. So, the world is becoming increasingly quiet and secluded. We have arrived at Deer Gate. In Deer Gate, we see the moon through the trees. So this is now a natural, more than a humanly populated landscape. We have trees, not people, and we have the moonlight cutting through the mist. And we reach the place of Hermit Pang. Now, uh, Lumen Shan, the Deer Gate, mountain, had been a hermitage in the past, in very ancient times, at least since the time of the Han Dynasty, when a, in the late Han Dynasty, I think a Buddhist institution had been uh, established at the mountain. And in the war in the, in the Three Kingdoms period, there was a hermit who lived in this mountain, her, the hermit Pang mentioned here. Now, this would have been 500 years before Men Haorang's time, so, you know, very, very hallowed antiquity. The cliffside, so now we have uh, Menhauran passing through this other person's, this ancient hermitage, which is probably relatively nearby to his own, and he's alone, there's nobody around him, only an abandoned hermitage, so the feeling of isolation, of uh, loneliness, of uh, retreating from the world is at its most intense. And the cliffside door the path through pines, now desolate. Few traces of the hermit who once passed back and forth. Of course, there are no traces in the hermitage. I mean, 500 years, it's half a millennium. It's a, an enormous amount of time. And uh, bearing in mind that Chinese constructions, and even more so hermit's constructions, are made of you know wood and uh, perishable materials. In fact, the most likely thing would be that there should be no trace at all of, of the previous hermit. And so there is an obliterating of the individual and the self in this retired space. Now, this last couplet has been translated differently in, in other versions of this poem that I've consulted. So in, in this version, in, in, in this is uh, Michael Farman's translation, He's one of the three translators of this edition of the 300 Town Poems. So in this version, the idea is that, in the second stanza, that Menhauran reaches the mountain, passes through an old hermitage, and meditates on how the traces of the previous hermit have disappeared. Uh, another version says, for this last couplet, the following. Doors in rock, 
path in times have long been quiet and forlorn. Only a recluse moves around here, back and forth, late at night. So in this other interpretation, the last couplet is not about uh, the old hermit who no longer haunts the place. It's about the new hermit, the poetic persona of Menghauran, who is the only one who keeps moving around here at this hour of the night. Now, this ambiguity is pretty easy to understand from things we've already mentioned before. Remember, in Chinese poetry and in the Chinese language, especially in the classical language, there are no indicators in the verbs of a person, of number, of, 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 of tense. Uh, there's a very sparing use of um, pronouns or no use of pronouns at all. So, you know, there is a, 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 an, an deliberate ambiguity that allows for many, many possible feelings. Are we, is the poet in the last line talking about present or past? Is, uh, is, is the, the protagonist of the last line a recluse from the past? Or are many recluses or a recluse from the present? So this is, this is unavoidable in Chinese poetry. It could be seen from our cultural and linguistic perspective as a handicap, as a limitation. On the other hand, it could be seen as a positive thing, as it allows for the imagination of the reader. It gives a greater scope for the imagination of the reader to fill in the, the, the poetic and linguistic structure that is placed before him. Okay, so uh, we didn't mention the, the themes of the poem. Uh, um, it, it's a landscape poem, although the landscape is not described in much detail. So you could say it's an example of landscape poetry. It's also an example of retirement poetry, of the retired life, which is implicitly uh, the one that the protagonist of this poem is leading uh, at the gate. And reminiscences of past ages, including hermits of the past. Quite a brief poem, quite uh, synthetic. Basically, you can, you know, you could summarize, it's a very visual poem, you could summarize it in two pictures, one for each stanza. In the first one, we would see the fishermen all piling in the bank or moving along in the Meng Hauran in the boat, probably a bit aloof and separated from the other fishermen, and looking meditatively as if listening to the bell that is ringing at that moment. A second picture with the poet completely alone in a forest under the moonlight, looking at a dilapidated, abandoned hermitage in front of him, deep in the forest. So, yeah, quite nice, quite nice.